Hi folks, and welcome to Dungeons & Dry Brushing. My name is Daniel, and today we're going to be working on a miniature from the Reaper Bones 5 Kickstarter. Today I've picked out this stone golem who can be useful as both an enemy to throw at your players as well as an ominous piece of scenery that you can just put down into a dungeon, even an office or a museum, in order to keep your players on guard. You could drop this guy into a wizard study or a merchant den and leave them wondering if he's just scenery or if he's a discreet bodyguard if they should decide to try anything crazy. Not that your players would ever try anything crazy. Now I'm going to head over to spray prime this mini so we can get started. So we have our stone golem primed and ready to paint. Now, because the miniature does look like it's entirely made of stone, there would be nothing wrong with giving it a simple paint job, mostly utilizing dry brushing and washes that would make it look like it's all carved from one piece of stone. But I want to add a little more visual interest to the monster. So I'm going to make the skirt that it's wearing look like it's carved from marble, and the helmet, gauntlets, and belt are going to go with a polished bronze look. So I'm going to start by making the skirt look like marble, because this, while this is a relatively easy process, it does require working with multiple spray paints. So if we do it right away, before we get to anything else, then the overspray from that won't really matter very much, which is great. So to do this, once we've sprayed the model entirely white, I used Citadel's White Scar Rattle Spray, just because it's what I had on hand. Once you've done that, we have to base coat the skirt in a different color. I've chosen Pro Acryl's Camo Green, because I like their paints, I like this color in particular, and the coverage on it is pretty nice. But pretty much any dark green will do. In fact, you don't have to go with dark green. You could use a dark brown or pretty much any other dark color. It just depends on what look you're going for. So here we are. Now that you've got the skirt base coated in dark green, the next step is going to be to wrap a used laundry sheet around the painted skirt. What we're going to do with this is just spray more white primer through the laundry sheet. That's going to give us a naturally spiderwebbed effect that should be easy to pass off as marble. And if it oversprays, it's just going to be white spray onto white spray. It's not gonna matter. So in general, I am all for reusing waste materials when it comes to crafting. In fact, I have a whole huge bin of them just over there. But when it comes to the laundry sheets, you you're going to want to source these yourself. Don't ask your players to contribute in that way. <laughs> As your humble GM, I'd just like to request your used laundry sheets, please. They're for our personal project. It's creepy. Stop it. Get some help. So with the first stage of our marble effect done, what we want to do is come in with some regular white acrylic paint. Just water it down a little bit. And just go around and touch up any areas of white that you may have gotten green onto in the previous steps. Because we're going to start the painting of the skin with speed paint, we just want to make sure that everything is completely flat white when we begin. Now things like the belt, stuff like that, that won't really matter. We won't be using speed paint for that, but since I'm here, I'm going to touch it up anyway, just because I'm like that. For this step, I've selected a speed paint called Runic Gray. It's a nice sort of a blue-gray instead of a flat gray, relatively cold which is nice because then we get a chance to bring in some contrast by choosing to use warmer metals for the helmet, the bracers, and the belt. So 
So you just want to apply your speed paints to all of the skin areas of the golem. Just nice, thin, even coats. And you want to make sure that you're using a cheap synthetic brush for this. Don't be, don't be using your Windsor & Newtons or your Sable hair brushes for this because all that you're going to accomplish by doing that is getting these speed paints up into the ferrule of the brush where they will dry and ruin it completely. So for stuff like this you always want to use the cheapest brushes you have basically. Okay, so this is our first coat of speed paint applied just all over the skin portion of the golem. Now we're going to want to leave this for about 10 to 20 minutes to dry since our next step is going to be dry brushing and you don't want to mess around with this stuff before it's completely dry because it does have some reactivation properties as I'm sure you've heard. So now, coffee break. Okay, here we are. I've given the speed paint a few minutes to dry and now we're going to move on to the next step. While the speed paints can make nice base coats, I tend to find that I like to pump up the contrast a little bit higher with them. And in this case, that means dry brushing. Now, I'm going to start with a nice coat of Glacier Blue from Vallejo. This will bring us up to a near white color without actually going full white on the highlights because I tend to reserve that effect for um, glowing effects or very small, super bright highlights that you might put on a gem or the tip of a sword, something like that. But very rarely would I go a full, complete, stark white on something like this. So here we are with the skin on our model completely dry brushed. We've got some nice contrast on it now. Just brought up the highlights a little bit. With that done, we're going to start painting the metallic accessories, the helmet, the belt, and the bracers. To do that, I want to bring in a bit of contrast by using a warmer tone. We're going to start with, I believe it's called Castellax Bronze by Games Workshop, or Citadel rather. But any bronze color here would do anything that's got that kind of warm tone to it. We're just going to apply a nice even base coat to anywhere that we want to be metal. Okay, so here we are with the base coats done for our metal. The next step on this is going to be using some rich gold from Pro Acryl to dry brush some highlights onto this model. Now if you're not comfortable with the dry brushing, uh, which is entirely reasonable because at this point if you dry brush some gold into a spot you don't want it to go, like uh, onto the skin or onto the skirt, then it's going to be really hard to fix at this point. So there is no shame in varnishing the model first before you come in with the dry brush. That way, if anything goes wrong, it's a lot easier to correct. But I am feeling, as usual, super overconfident, which means I'm going to go ahead and mess this up on video as part of my first YouTube video. So, uh, cool. Cool, cool, cool. Okay, so the dry brushing on the metal details is done. And while I have the gold out, I'm going to attend to two other things. In the meantime, as you can hear, all of my neighbors have simultaneously decided to turn on their lawnmowers. And if you can't hear it, that means I've found a way to fix it in post. Or I re-recorded this entirely. Go me. The first thing, though, is that I'm going to paint the golem's eyes golden. 
Partially this is just because I like the idea of him having golden eyes. I think it's kind of creepy. But it could also serve as a lure to your party's rogue if he's inclined to make trouble. And you could even have him do something like roll to remove the golem's eyes if he wants to do that, give him an excuse to use those thieves tools. A roll to gouge someone's eyes out? That's sick. You're a sick person. Okay, with our eyes dotted in gold, we are now going to do one last thing with the rich gold, and that is that we're going to take some of these cracks in the skirt from the texture and just fill them in like they're gold veins. A lot of marble tends to have veins of gold or other minerals in it, and this is a way of not only enhancing that marble effect, but also just uh, bringing that gold color a little further down the model so that it helps to tie things together. All right, guys, so there's only one major step to go before our golem is game ready, and that's a wash. Now, a lot of the time as D&D players, crafters, and painters, we tend to make stone gray by default. Well, there's nothing wrong with that, but if you keep your eyes open while you're outside, you'll see that stone comes in all manner of colors. So if you want to use something a little wilder in tone for your wash, or red or purple, blue even, that would be fine. In fact, brown is a great choice as well, just to give something an earthy, darker color while still bringing in that contrast. But I like the tones we already have on the gold. I just want to do something that's going to bring our shadows darker to make our highlights lighter. So for me, that means a black oil wash. The varnish we've already applied to the model is going to help the oil wash sink into the recesses. This will preserve the majority of the color while also enhancing the depth that we get from it. Ultimately, with an oil wash, you can remove any amount that you decide you don't want afterwards, or if you feel it darkens down the model too much, or if you just want to bring back some highlights, you can come in with a makeup sponge or a Q-tip and a bit of oil spirits and get rid of any black wash that you've decided you don't want on there. All right, so we've been about 20 minutes in letting the paint set up. Now, you can come in with a makeup brush or a Q-tip, something like that, and some white spirits, and you can just sponge away any of the shading that's too much for you. Bring it up a little bit. You can focus this on upward facing areas if you want to, just to bring up a more natural look to your highlights. So once you're done removing any of the oil paint that you don't want, you're just going to want to let the rest set up for another 20-30 minutes before you do anything else to the model. This is just to make sure that this is all, you know, sealed. It's not going to be completely dry, not for probably 24 hours. But once it's sealed enough, you can move on to the next steps without worrying about getting oil paint everywhere. Our oil paint is dry, and we just have a few last simple steps to finish off this model. One of those steps, actually, in a way, both of those steps are the base. Now, for a creature like this, I prefer a fairly generic base because I'm going to use this monster probably a dozen times and each time will probably be in a dozen different settings. So, I'm just going to go ahead and use a contrast paint on the base. In this case, I've selected Wildwood. It's a fairly dark brown and it's going to help keep the focus on the miniature rather than moving it over to the base. With our Wildwood contrast on the base, it's time to move on to the very last step. And for me, that is always painting the rim of the base 
For this, I like to use Vallejo Game Color Black. This is an extremely glossy black that, in all honesty, I do not like to use for just about anything else. But when it comes to finishing the base rim, I won't do it with anything else for a D&D Mini. I feel like it makes the model look like a game piece, and that's a look that I like. So that's how I finish pretty much all of my Dungeons & Dragons miniatures. Now with that done, it's time for the big, overly dramatic YouTube reveal. Here we go, a finished table-ready model using simple techniques that looks good. I know Reaper are not the most detailed models out there, but when it comes to growing a collection of D&D monsters, there's really no better way, especially for beginners. And for me, Reaper hits a good midpoint between detail and ease of painting that I like personally. So that's it, guys. I'm relatively happy with how that model turned out, and I think it'll be a good menace to my players in my next campaign. Thank you for joining me for my first video. If you could like, subscribe, comment, do any of that stuff, or all of it, it would mean a lot to me and it would help the channel. Thanks, and I'll see you on the next one.